Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Play Better Poker with Learn WPT. My name is Katie Stone. I am a Learn WPT instructor, and sitting next to me, eh, he doesn't really need Hello. an introduction, Tony Dunst, commentator Hi. and host of the World Poker Tour and Learn WPT instructor. That's right. Good to be here with you Thank today. you so much for being here. Of course. So you guys might notice that we are in a little bit of a different space. Uh, we are actually at the fabulous HyperX Esports Arena. Well, we're in your home. Home field advantage. Home today. court. Yeah. And you've been here a few times Both doing, a, doing things. a player and a commentator. Typically, I'm up in the booth with Vince, enjoying his jokes. And uh, today, on the felt here with you, but we're also going to look at some hands when, from when I last played here at HyperX. Yeah, and that was just a few years ago, um, which, you know, pre-pandemic, pre which kind of feels like yesterday for a lot of people. Um, but that's, it's really cool that, you know, this is the place that the World Poker Tour uh, final tables are broadcast live and also recorded for TV. And this is where you guys do all of uh, your, your magic work. And then sometimes you get the chance to make a final table and then we've got that footage. So we're going to show you guys a couple of hands in a little bit um, on this fabulous 50 foot screen behind me. Um, but first, getting into the actual topic of the show, you know, play better poker. We talk about ways that we get better at poker. We talk to, you know, players that frequent the World Poker Tour and are successful. You are a legend. You are iconic figure in poker, not just for the World Poker Tour, but in poker. There haven't been many people who have been around this long and no doubt things have changed. So poker landscape has changed. Training has changed. Yes. Improving has changed. And I want to pick your brain and, you know, talk about your observations from the beginning until now and kind of, you know, the hurdles that you've encountered and, and what adjustments you've made. Well, when I got started in poker in the early 2000s, it wasn't even clear where you went to get quality information or get an education in the game. There were a handful of books. Certainly Super System by Doyle Brunson was amongst the most prominent at that time. I remember that one. But there wasn't that much on tournament poker, which yeah. is what I was most attracted to at the time. There was a book out by TJ Cloutier, and within a few years there was one out by, actually a series of books out by Dan Harrington. But on tournaments specifically, that was about all you had to work with. I guess Helmuth came out with one around that time, but... Um, mostly players in my generation gravitated towards learning online and building these online communities. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people that I know in the game, a uh, good example is Lucky Chewy. Yeah, are people our that I met discussing the game on the 2 plus 2 poker forums. Mm -hmm. And we would play online, post our hands there, show up and sweat each other's final tables on the various online sites of the day, and then post these hands and kind of debate back and forth what we thought the best play was. And uh, back then, there weren't that many computer programs that you could use to really check things. There was a little bit of like, you know, there was something called Poker Stove where you could run your hands pre-flop equity against another hand, or maybe it was even a range of hands or something like that. Um, but in the early days, there were very few tools and very few resources. And then as the industry started to blossom, we had the first training sites. Mm -hmm. I remember that Johnny Bax, who I was just playing with the other yeah. day, he took down a tournament here in Vegas, uh, had one of the earliest training sites that I watched videos for tournament content on. There was kind of an expansion in the arena of training sites. And then over the years, I think that poker increasingly became a game that was not fully solved, but was digested by computers mm -hmm. and that gave us a better hint about the kind of strategies we should adopt and you know exactly when each of those programs came out and how sophisticated they are i'm not ex i'm not exactly sure but i know that you know in the modern era if you want to study poker there are literally like a half dozen solving programs that sure. you can put onto a serious desktop computer to start and break down the little nuances of the game so you can study things really specifically and it feels like a far cry from looking at these tournament poker books where they wouldn't include how many chips were involved in the hands they wouldn't include the positions they wouldn't include anything about reads it was just like here's the cards here's the board what do we do um, yeah 
big difference between then and now. Big, huge difference. Yeah, I remember, you know, I started poker a little bit after you, but, you know, you were already a hero by the time I started playing poker. Everybody remembers Bond 18 on mm. 2 plus 2 and online. And, um, you know, I remember also just kind of being a little bit lost. Right. Uh, especially as a woman in poker, there weren't too many female players who uh, I was able to, to kind of go to and, and ask help. So 2 plus 2 was also... Um, was also a really big influence for me too. Uh, I, I definitely went and found hands there and, and I would read, you know, your hands. I remember my first time posting in High Stakes MTT and, and uh, almost having a heart attack after I pressed the submit button because right. that was, you know, yeah, you were probably going to get ripped apart. It could be a critical space and you had to be open to having people tell you you really misplayed a hand or, you know, an internet lexicon, you played this terribly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you had to be ready for that when you dove into the forums. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I was very, you know, hesitant to make that first post. And I, I think it's just a good example of where we've come, you know, where we were. It probably took me a few years to get to get the guts to, to post my first hand history online, right. uh, you know, on, on an online forum, um, which isn't the best environment to welcome new players, right? This no. is This is, we want to um, you know, if a player has the desire to improve or, or to learn, we want to be able to say, oh, well, you can do this and you can do this and you right. can do this and, and everybody learns differently. And, and, um, and now we can, now we can. We've got so many, you know, different options. Uh, you know, uh, Learn WPT has lots of great strategy episodes. And, um, you know, you actually made an entire course of episodes based on your final table here at uh, HyperX. Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. And it was nice to be able to draw from the footage yeah. of the show and in the stream that we had and break it down after the fact. Because normally if you're playing a session, whether it's live or online, you know, you can like record hands in real time, but you don't have the ability to completely replay them I mean, sure. online, certainly, but um, not live. You know, you just kind of have to trust that your notes are accurate. Yeah. Live. If you don't record the hands somehow, they have a tendency to... I just float away. <laughs> right. Yes. So it was really nice to be able to, to go back over that one. And that was around yeah. the time that I was really reinvesting myself in learning poker. Speaking of a hand, I think we've got a pretty interesting hand. You know, I went, I went back and looked at that 15K final table uh, because you did have so many interesting hands. Mm. And one of the hands that caught my eye was this hand. So take us through, because this was a really, you know, ICM specific interesting hand. Right. And we were still five handed at this juncture, I believe. And I was kind of like a middling stack. I was probably third in ships. Uh, as we can see, I'm out chipping Simon, but Ola and Ryan Tosic both had me about two to one. So there's like a moderate amount of ICM pressure on me. It's important that I don't force myself into playing a large pot unnecessarily, especially like we're 60 something blinds deep to start this hand. And as we can see, Griffin here at 110K has a really short stack. And so it's very important at this juncture that I outlast uh, Griffin at, at this stage and make sure I get that pay jump from his you know, likely bust in near future. So when I get this flop against Ola, first of all, it's a, it's a board texture that connects pretty well with his small blind range, and I should have a, a moderate amount of checks to begin with. But in particular, under ICM, you want to play a check heavier strategy, and it's real nice to mix it in with some of these strong draws so that when we get to the later streets, if Ole decides to turn a hand that's maybe like, you know, a pair with, you know, maybe he has like 8-9 suited or Jack-10 suited, Jack-9 suited. Should he decide to turn a pair with a blocker to the straight into a bluff on a later street, I can handle all of that pressure by checking back some strong draws that get realized on the turn or on the river. So, you know, this time around, I just hit the nuff luck on the turn, and it's kind of... Pretty beautiful. You know, it's, it's hard to screw it up. Ola Betts <laughs> and I call. I, I think I like the call here. My hand's very well protected. I'm in position. I think that if I raise the turn, it just screams strength mm -hmm. to Ola. And so if I want to maximize the amount of chips that I get out of him here, calling on the turn is probably going to perform best. I really like how Ola played this hand as well. Certainly he had the option to three bet pre or call. Uh, his hand performs pretty well 
in both categories. Now, what were you thinking regarding bet sizing here? Because I know you took some time. Right. On this river with such a strong hand, I think I mostly want to choose a polarized sizing, which means, you know, I'm betting really big, and I think I bet around pot here, if memory serves. You it looks like I bet did. just over Slightly pot. Slightly over pot, yeah. And I like that sizing because not only does it maximize the amount that I could get out of Ola if he does have a strong hand, such as, you know, two pair or like top pair with a hard blocker. Mm -hmm. But with this category of hand, you know, whether that's I get here with ace 10 with the ace of hearts or the ace high flush itself, I think we just want to polarize our sizing and go quite big. And uh, Ole, I think, played this hand really well, you know, just managed to minimize how much he lost up against a really good hand and did not have one with relevant blockers to make the river call against the polarized sizing. So overall, pretty, pretty happy with that hand. And uh, I like how Ola played it as well. Yeah, he looked kind of tempted. He looked, he looked he, on the end. He yeah. looked kind of like he really, really, really wanted to just flick it in and make you turn your cards over. Right. Yeah. I think if he had had a heart in his hand, he probably would have looked me up. But without a heart in his hand, I don't think he really has the right type of hand to call my polarized river sizing there. So, you know, in these big spots, there's never any reason to act rushed. He can take as much time as he wants, think it over. I mean, technically we have the action clock, but you know, yeah, he's, he's got his time bank chips. Um, and I'm not too surprised that he opted to pass on the Yeah, river. yeah. I loved this hand too because uh, you know the board is is what we would call a, a draw heavy board yeah. definitely a board that can put more money in but I loved how uh, you know and, and I think a lot of players especially you know recreational players amateur players would see oh we've got the ace high flush draw let's right. just pile we money in we have to in. auto bet the flop just pile just just make it as big and and, yeah. and I loved how you explained the hand and and you know you, you did do an entire course of these hands on Learn WPT, so you guys can uh, check out the site for, for a more extended explanation of the hands. I think you played 17 hands um, that you went through every single one and, and, and talked about all of them. One of the questions I had, though, about, you know, when you're when you're playing in this arena, mm -hmm. um, is your overall mindset because, you know, we were talking a little bit about this before the show, right? Um, you know, the space, the commentary space, and then there's the playing space. It's a little bit tough. I don't know how you guys know how tough it is to do both. Uh, it is pretty tough, and you are probably the best that I've ever seen do it. How do you make those adjustments? You know, you're you're here on this huge, huge stage. You guys, this is an amazing place. I hope you guys can come and see this someday. Um, but. How does your mindset differ from when you are in the commentating space versus playing one of the biggest final tables you've ever played in your life? It's a pretty strong uh, contrast between the introverted side of your personality and extroverted side. When you're doing commentary and when you're working in an ambassador role, uh, you need to be very social and outgoing. Of course, doing the commentary with Vince, you're just kind of running narration all day long. But when you play poker, most people, most serious professional poker players are fairly introverted at the table because you, you're just thinking the entire time sure. about the hands that you've just played, your reads on your opponents, what their mental state is, um, how many chips everyone has, how that affects your incentives to ladder. And so on the day of filming a final table that I'm playing mm -hmm. at, uh, I, I prefer to be a little more in my own space. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy at how well the WPT works with me on that, where they are content to let me you know clearly demarcate between when i am playing and and when i am working mm -hmm. because sometimes there are days where it's earlier in the tournaments and you know i need to do announcements or meet and greets or fill in the blank sure. and we have those kind of activities going on but as we get deeper in the tournament the wpt is fantastic about saying oh you know what tony you're deep in this tournament mm -hmm. you need to concentrate on playing you know we're going to clear anything on your schedule and, and make sure that there's not stuff weighing on your mind that would distract you from being able to play. And yeah, when I'm on the table, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed, I'm pretty calm, but I'm trying to stay really focused. So as you said, we were talking earlier about how there was a lot of people up in the room uh, that day, you know, kind so of partying, awesome. you, hanging out. You didn't out. even hear me. I was whooping. I was, I I was like hanging over yeah. the railing, like, let's go, go. I only <laughs> vaguely recall that there were other people present besides who was at was the table. It was packed. It was yeah. packed. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was awesome. Talk about your preparation away from the table these days. So, right. you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit about the progression of poker training, you know, back in the, the days before uh, training sites and online forums, it was kind of the wild, wild west. Yes. Um, you know, I in particular felt very lost and it uh, took me a long time to, you know, make strides in my improvement because of that. Um, talk a little bit about, if you can, mm -hmm. uh, what your general study slash work slash improvement, because I know that looks a lot different. It's not right. just one thing every single day you That's might right. not have. Um, what do you alternate between and how do you get yourself kind of in that space like, okay, now it's study time. Now it's get down to business. And, and what do you do? What does that look like? For me, most days I wake up. I get some exercise, come home, put on the coffee, and uh, the first hour or two of that period is focusing on study. Usually during my sessions, I'm writing down the hands that I played, or I might open up a hand history and look through it for key decision points or hands that I played that I was uncertain of, uh, and then I'll run those through Pile Solver. If it's a situation with ICM, I'll run it through a program called ICMizer. Um, there's another called Simple Three-Way, mm -hmm. where in the event you're in a multi-way spot, uh, you can run it through that. Um, simple Pre-Flop as well is another one, which to be honest, I haven't become as fluent in as some of the others. Uh, and while I am running the solves on these hands, I'm generally taking notes. This is more of a personal preference. Mm -hmm. Not everybody learns in the same way, but I find when I write things down, mm -hmm. it records it in my mind mm -hmm. a little deeper than if I just run the sim, look at the output and say, oh, okay, next time I'm supposed to check that hand. Like it's just, sure. it's tough and it's nice to be able to, you know, let's say once every couple of weeks, go back in my notes, look at all of the hands that I've written out. And it's important, I think, to write the notes for not just what your hand does in that situation, but what your range does in that situation mm -hmm. and how different parts of your range are supposed to react to what your opponent does or where do you draw your bluffs from or you know what kind of hands are checking here that surprise you. Write the, all of that down so that when you go back and review it later, it's like, okay, here's the hand. This was mm -hmm. a sticking point for me. And here's what all of the pieces of my range are supposed to do during this hand. And ideally, instead of trying to memorize this crazy wealth of information, what kind of generalities or heuristics can I draw about these kind of spots? That's what I'm really looking for because you know, computers give us these crazy, complicated, precise outputs about how to approach poker, but our human minds can't keep all of that intact. Well, we can interpret them incorrectly sometimes. Right, that as well. We don't always know why the computer is recommending what it's recommending. So I just try and draw some heuristics up for myself so that when I approach play, I'm like, okay, you know, we've got this ace five deuce flop. I know that this is a board that's not a pure C bet. Mm -hmm. What are the category of hands that are checking back at some percentage? Sure. And, you know, Tony's talking about a lot of, you know, very high level preparation. One of the really cool tools on Learn WPT is the WPT GTO trainer that kind of takes all of that work kind yes. of bundles it up for you and does it for you and kind of spits it out. So you don't have to do all of that very specific refined work that the elite pros do. We kind of try to make it as simple as possible. Um, but it's a good tool to get reps in. So we, uh, I like to do 25 hands a day right. just to make sure I'm sharp. Uh, and it's gonna tell you, you know, this was, uh, you know, a good decision on the flop. This was, you know, maybe not a great decision on the river, um, but the WPT GTO trainer kind of takes everything and bundles it and simplifies it for a player of, of any level. Yeah, to give a sports analogy, it's like getting batting practice if you're a professional baseball player or going to the driving range if you're a professional golfer. Like there is a certain amount of reps that you need to get in to ingrain those positive habits mm -hmm. and mentalities. And the GTO trainer is a really good way of doing that without having to buy a whole desktop, install these programs, learn how to use these sure. programs, spend the hours, you know, running the Sims themselves. Yep. The trainer has got so much of that taken care of already and you can just concentrate on getting those reps in. And as I said, trying to draw some guidelines from what you study that you can apply towards your, your in-game play. Absolutely, and speaking of the trainer, 
we've got another hand that is a good example of a hand that you might see in the trainer and would help you understand what to do in the situation. Another hand from your 15K final table um, that I found absolutely fascinating when I saw it. I was here during the live hand and I right. can't believe I missed this hand uh, when it happened. But Tony, this is a pretty incredible hand. Yeah, this is one of my, this is probably my favorite hand from this final table. Oh, good. I mean, it's also like, you know, kind of the most <laughs> impactful pot that I win at this final table. But the way it played out is kind of interesting because it opens with Ryan Tosic raising and he's raising a lot. Like 7-6-0 is way too wide and like way too wide in this circumstance. <laughs> and I was conscious of that at the table, but I still thought that something like ace-queen at this stack depth should be mixing three bets and flats. Um, and that Keeping mm -hmm. some worse aces in Ryan's range getting to the flop would be very profitable. Mm -hmm. But then as we see behind, Ola wakes up with ace-jack into big blind, and this is an excellent hand to use as a squeeze in this situation. So not surprising to see, you know, Ola getting it dead on yet again. Mm -hmm. But now when the action comes back to me and we're like 45-ish blinds deep, I have a hand that has some potential to flat, but I think the offsuit combination plays pretty well as an all-in pre-flop. Uh, and I think my hand is a little bit under-repped because I flatted Ryan, you know, button versus cutoff with ace-queen here. And there's less ICM pressure on me as well because Ryan and Ole have me considerably outchipped. I think Simon was the uh, other one that was in play and we were roughly tied. So there wasn't a lot of pressure on me to avoid a potential all in here because, you know, in the, in the previous spot, we saw that Griffin had 10 big blinds. And if that were the case here, I probably would not be back jamming ace queen and then risking getting in a flip against Ole or running into ace king uh, and getting eliminated. But with the way chips are distributed now, there's less pressure on me and Ole is still going to be squeezing light here some of the time. So I think the back jam makes a lot of sense following that action. And now the decision being back on Ole, he's got kind of an interesting one because he's getting an excellent price here in a spot where I'm not ever bluffing per se, but a lot of the hands that make this play in my shoes are stuff like eights through tens. Mm -hmm. And he's flipping against all of those, getting almost two to one. So I think making the call here is awful tempting in Ola's shoes, and that's what we see him considering. Uh, you know, even using the time bank ship mm -hmm. to think this over. And he's kind of thinking like, how often do I think Tony is doing this with pairs? Does he ever show up with ace five suited? Do I think he would flat ace queen against Ryan pre-flop? And he may have even discounted ace queen a little bit because he thinks, well, Ryan's opening too much. You know, Tony's a capable, aggressive player. And I think he blocks he would mostly, a little. Yeah, he blocks it as well. I think Tony would mostly three bet ace queen. So perhaps the range that he does this with is more pair heavy and I'm getting almost two to one on what's gonna be a flip. And yeah, you can see his face when he, when he learns the news that he's up against Ace Queen, which is, you know, the one hand that he didn't want to see here. Yeah. And uh, big, big spot. This yeah. is definitely one of the bigger all-ins in my career. And, you know, the reason I loved this hand, Tony, is because your shove was for, what, about 50, 55 big blinds? Yeah, 45, 50, right? Pre, in there. 50 yeah. big blinds. And, you know, what's so cool about this is you don't see these kinds of shoves too often in live poker, uh, especially at this big of a final table. Right. And, and what really Im was you know, very impressed upon me in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder what I can't remember what he said to me that I thought was so funny. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, and the flop was that good. My yeah. goodness. I flop him basically <laughs> dead. I, I, I remembered, of course, that I won the hand, but I didn't really know how it went down. So that's, that's so funny to me. Um, yeah, I mean, what really just was super impressive upon me about this hand um, was, you know, your poise in mm -hmm. the hand, right? Like, this is a huge spot. This is yes. the largest stage in poker, uh, a World Poker Tour 15K final table. Um, this is, you know, uh, a very high pressure situation, very high dollar situation. First place was, do you remember about what first 450 place was? 450 yeah, not, yeah. Not, not a small amount. Um, and then to go ahead and to put that much money in the middle pre, uh, you know, you, you looked very calm and collected and poised. We right. finally got a little smile out of you when, when, we, saw, when we saw the call. 
Um, but it was, it was so impressive for me because it really kind of encapsulated your entire career. You know, what has taken, uh, you know, to get you here, what all the work that you have uh, put into uh, not just your poker game, but your commentating. Because right. uh, it is a very, very difficult thing to stay at the top of your game and to, to be an elite in, in both. Yeah, it is tricky because you have to split your time and find a compromise between your professional obligations and your obligation to yourself to keep your game at a very high level um, and make sure that you have your priorities straight at times. And, and it just kind of depends, you know, where I am in the world and whether we're at an event. At an event, I very much consider the WPT to be like my number one priority. If they sure. need me to do something or be somewhere, uh, that's what I'm going to be available to do. Whereas when I'm at home, and you know, I do create a little bit of content for WPT at home, but for the most part, when we're not in production or at an event, I'm left to my own devices. Um, it's on me to take the initiative to keep studying and keep practicing so that I can hopefully make some of these final tables and be on the felt instead of just in the booth. Any mental game prep you do? No, actually a lot of people are really high on the mental game aspect, many people are high on meditation. I know Chewy probably spoke to mm -hmm. the merits of meditation, sure. and uh, I very much believe in the merits of those things, but for whatever reason, it hasn't been an aspect that I felt like I needed to spend as much focus on. I think that I was uh, born with a good disposition for poker, and that like I'm not a really emotional person, and I don't feel the impact of losing as bad as many people do, mm -hmm. um, which which sounds like a, a strange advantage to have. Like I don't feel as much, but like you spend so much time in tournament poker in a state of losing or having just lost or something just gone mm -hmm. wrong or just busted the tournament that if you're a bit more numb to that side of the emotion, it makes doing this for a living a lot easier to digest. Whereas I think very emotional people who try and play tournament poker for a living are like almost drawing dead. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just too savage on your expectations to handle this much losing all the time if you're an emotional person. Agree, and, and I've, also, I've also experienced that same feeling, uh, you know, being an online tournament player for the last 10 years, the majority of my poker career, I've lost a lot. You know, I've, I've spent the majority of- We're of, career losers. We are, what I'm we do. a professional loser, you know, yeah. <laughs> essentially. But what it's done is it's really toughened you up. And, and, yeah. and, and in times where, uh, you know, there might be other areas of your life that, that might be tough, maybe you're having some financial issues, maybe you're having some personal issues. Uh, no one is immune to those things. I can tell you, though, that my career as an online poker tournament player has helped in my ability to manage those other situations while staying full steam ahead, eye on the prize, at the end of the rainbow kind yeah. of thing. You it know? gives you a very long-term mindset and some thick skin for things going wrong. Do you remember what your, your latest strategy episode was on Learn WPT? I know you just popped one out recently. I did one recently on finding the correct small pairs to triple yes. barrel. That was it, yes. On boards that are advantageous for the preflop razor, because on some of these boards it can be tough to define where your bluffs come mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of players at the intermediate level think, okay, well, if I'm in a bluff on some of these boards, like I want to have cards that interact with the board, and that's that's a very sensible Valid, approach. Sure. But when you want to expand that to include all of the hands that can profitably bluff, mm -hmm. you have to reach down for the small pairs. Yeah, I remember I, I wasn't able to watch the whole episode, um, but I, I just got the clip and I saw, I, I saw that that was uh, definitely going to be an interesting episode. So make sure you guys uh, go to learnwpt.com and, and check that out. What's what's next for you? Any any live poker, any online poker coming up? Playing a lot of online poker over the next couple of weeks. Wins running a tournament this weekend that I may get off my ass and go play. Yeah. Um, oop, losing our losing our mic here. One second. And um, then I'm going to go down to the WPT happening at uh, Seminole Hard Rock yeah. in mid-April. Uh, it's a 3500 main, plus, of course, great prelims and side events during yep. the whole run of affairs there. So, I, man, I love that stop. I always really look forward to that uh, that stop. I mean, the turnouts, the fields, 
the way they run it, everything's just fantastic. Yeah, I think fields have been pretty crowded in Florida. So yes. if you guys are interested in playing any live poker uh, at any point in the next few weeks, you probably would love to join us in Florida. The World Poker Tour uh, Championship event runs April 8th and 9th uh, in Florida at the Seminole Hard Rock. But the entire series starts, I believe, March 31st. So there's tons of prelims. Uh, opening with, I'm not sure if it's a 1K or a, or a big 500 that's opening, but there's a, there's a really big opening event. Um, the other really cool thing that's happening at the time, and you guys should definitely come down and join us, Learn WPT workshops are back. That's right. Uh, we are having the first live workshop post-pandemic, uh, and it'll be April 1st and 2nd. There is a 2nd uh, and 3rd, a welcome party on the 1st. So we're gonna have Lucky Chewy down there, uh, Risen. I'll be down there as well. We've got the we're bringing the labs back, Tony. So this is really cool. We'll have uh, an instructor at each table, and everybody's playing, and kind of some hands-on experience, which I think is really good. For, yeah, they're very interactive yeah. workshops. Yeah, and get a chance to to talk to to some really good players. And you know, I I, I wouldn't mind spending the afternoon with with Chewy at the poker table. So. I've learned more <laughs> about tournament poker from Chewy than any other person on the planet. Yeah. So if you have a chance to get him as your instructor, that's your guy. Yes, and I certainly am enjoying learning from the both of you as well. Mm -hmm. So, well, Tony, this has been wonderful. Thank you so course, much for joining us for our third episode of Play Better Poker. And I think what we had already decided with Alti and Chewy was we're going to have kind of a big group episode in December at the Five Diamond uh, Bellagio WPT uh, Championship, which will be really cool. So Right down the road. We'll it, come back and, and, and do a big show in December that uh, we hope that you guys will tune in. So make sure you guys come down to Florida with us. The WPT $3,500 championship event is running April 8th and 9th. The Learn WPT workshop is running April 2nd and 3rd. You can follow all of us on social. I am at Katie Stone Poker. Tony Dunst is at Tony Dunst TV and Learn WPT and the World Poker Tour all at the appropriate social channels. Anything else you'd like to, uh, to say? You covered it. <laughs> I don't usually have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I've been told. All right, guys, this has been great. We're so excited uh, to be here in our new home at the HyperX Sports Arena. We hope you guys will join us soon. Our next episode will be live from the Seminole Hard Rock with none other than Darren Elias on April 7th. We will see you guys there.